From the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University, this is Digital Campus, a bi-weekly discussion of how digital media and technology are affecting learning, teaching, and scholarship at colleges, universities, libraries, and museums. This is Digital Campus number 41 for the 28th of April 2009. An interview with Stan Katz. I'm Dan Cohen. Welcome back to the Digital Campus podcast for our 41st incarnation of the podcast. And for our 41st, it's just me and you, Mills. Mills Kelly, our regular panelist and Twitter curmudgeon. Hi, Mills. Hi, Dan. How are you? If you want to fake follow the fake Mills on Twitter, it is, of course, at Ed Wired on Twitter. Um, but, of course, you'll find the real Mills Kelly at edwired.org for his very excellent blog covering the world of education and technology. And, of course, I'm Dan Cohen, found at dancohen.org. And we're broadcasting live from the Center for History and New Media at George Mason University. Uh, well, Mills, we've got coming up uh, later in the hour um, – an interview with uh, Stan Katz, the wonderful Stan Katz, who has done yep. so much for over two decades in the world of uh, technology and the humanities and institutions relating to museums and libraries and academia. So we're looking forward to that, and we're going to leave ample time to talk to Stan, who has very graciously taken time out of his busy schedule up at Princeton to talk to the two of us. Who would ever want to do that? Um, we will wire the large cash payment to him at the end of the podcast. Right. That's um, right. So uh, lots of news to catch up on. Uh, we've taken yeah, but should few, you, do you think we, you should we, mention well, the biggest why, news, why there are right? only two of us? Yeah. Yes. Well, the biggest, I think we hinted at this on uh, podcast number 40, but um, Tom Scheinfeld, uh, the third leg in the, in the stool that is digital campus uh, and his wife and Scheinfeld had their baby, Luke, Joseph Scheinfeld. Um, so we're really delighted um, uh, for Tom and Anne and for little Luke. Um, and so if you want to give him some thanks, you can um, direct message or reply to him at, at Found History on Twitter. I'm sure he'd appreciate that. But uh, it's wonderful to have a baby in the digital campus and CH&M uh, family. Uh, and we're very excited for them about that. And so Tom is taking some paternity leave. And of course, that leaves Mills, you and me, the um, older the fathers, old. right, older fathers right. who uh, can't get their act together to do another podcast. Um, well, let's jump into the news. There's actually been quite a bit of news. Oh, gosh. We, I guess we have to start with this Facebook study that's come out of uh, education researchers from Ohio State University and Ohio Dominican University who looked at Facebook users, 219 students from Ohio State and um, looked at um, those who had they had Facebook accounts, which surprisingly, I can't believe this, only 148 out of the 219 students had Facebook accounts. I guess half of them were graduate students. Which is, yeah, that's probably maybe the that's maybe yeah. that's piece of it. But even yeah. there, I'm kind of surprised. Um, but uh, they found out that uh, Facebook users in the study had GPAs that were about a half point lower than those who were non Facebook users. Mills, please discuss. Uh, all I can say is shocker. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this this one this would fall into the category of the incredibly obvious result of a research study. <laughs> it should be a new segment on the Digital Campus and, podcast, right? The and the, I'm 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 anxiously awaiting the follow-on study for the uh, the Twitter using community to validate the the fact that their productivity in the workplace has dropped significantly as a result of all the tweeting. <laughs> Yeah, right. Okay. Well, I'd be happy to participate in that study. I'll, I'll have to tell you about a little tw Twitter experiment I did in just a second. But, um, well, I mean, is this this is surely there's got to be a uh, correlation does not equal causation piece of this study. It's got to be. I mean, it's <laughs> this one. I'm. I'm. I, okay. I would. I have. I'll admit. I haven't read the entire results of the study. I've just read the summaries. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm. So this is like saying, okay, students who listen to music more than other students have lower or higher GPAs. It's, I, I'm, 
okay, sure. They, if they spend more time on Facebook, they they maybe and they're just totally addicted to it. Sure, maybe their grades suffer, but that's also true if they spend way too much time shooting baskets, you know, behind their dorm. So um, distraction equals lower grades, I guess, is the answer from this particular study. Yeah, right. Surely that's got to be a piece of it. There, there was one little interesting tidbit um, in, in here, at least in the. I guess they they're just issuing some preliminary results, and they're going to present the entire study at the. American Education Research Association. Um, but one piece that I found interesting was that the science and tech majors were more likely to use Facebook than students in the humanities. Hmm. Did you well, see that line? Yeah. yeah. I, oh, yeah, 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 sure. And So, uh, so do, are they more procrastinating or do they need the time off away from these deep mental uh, calculations that they need to do? Or maybe it turns out that if you're a science and tech major, you find it easier to socialize online than mm. face to in you know in the yeah. analog world. I don't know. Right. I mean, I, right. I uh, these are all depressing options, aren't they? Right. Right. And lead to a whole series of jokes, which are probably not appropriate for a family podcast. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, we won't, uh, you know, now that I'm off Facebook, actually, my GPA has gone way up. Excellent. Excellent. Boy, we still haven't talked about the the exodus from Facebook. We'll have to wait until Tom gets back on. Yeah. Well, I'm over here on Twitter. Let me let me tell you about the little Twitter experiment I did, which I'm not sure if you heard because you're not on Twitter. No, no, I didn't. I'm shockingly yes. still uh, yeah, So you would have clueless. missed that because uh, yeah. you're not where you should be. Um the, uh, so I did this experiment. I gave a talk in New York City, just sort of talking about the frontiers of digital scholarship and some of the potential avenues, including uh, things like text mining and social computing. And and, um, and so at the beginning of the talk, so I spoke for about an hour, um, I launched a little Twitter experiment where I um, put up a picture on, or linked to a picture on Twitter um, to an artifact uh, that was discovered in the late 19th century uh, in Illinois. It was a shell that had etched into it uh, the image of a spider. And um, and so I told my Twitter followers to see if they could figure it out before the end of the hour was up. And then I just left open a um, feed of my Twitter feed on the screen while I spoke, which was actually rather distracting. I had to put it away for a little while because things came really fast and furious. And actually it took 28 minutes for uh, to crowdsource the answer of what it was. Um, now, what I was trying to get at was a, sort of a little experiment um, of what's the modern equivalent of the writer's query that you used to see in uh, academic journals where someone, right, someone right, would write right. in and say, you know, I'm working on a book on this topic and I've, I've kind of found this notebook in the archives and I can't figure out what this you know, references or something like that. And these would go out in journals and this was done in the Victorian age, which I, I look at very, very commonly, uh, was done and you'd have, um, correspondents write back, you know, obviously months later because of the cycle of production of these journals, um, with, with kind of answers on that. Um, and it's really fascinating. I'm going to do a, a very full blog post. It's taken me a long time to write it up simply because there were, um, I think there ended up being about 100 people who participated in various ways in trying to answer this. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it. I think I sort of proved my point. It wasn't a completely successful experiment in that there were a bunch of people who just Googled Shell Illinois Spider and quickly discovered um, the Smithsonian records for this um, archival dig of Native American artifacts that took place in St. Clair County in 1882. Um, and, and part of the payoff on this, I was also trying to hide part of the story, but the, the guy who did it end up being a very famous um, uh, anthropologist and archaeologist, um, and, uh, and then later on the uh, director of the National Gallery of Art. But this is something he did when he was very young in his 20s. Um, and so it was something that I could see, let's say, someone on Twitter doing today who might end up right, doing in some right. um, parts of prominence. So, so I was, of course, expecting something like the modern equivalent of that Victorian correspondence. And, and actually, it started out that way where I did have some followers on Twitter who were um, uh, archaeologists who said, well, you know, it looks like um, this is the kind of thing that would be worn around the neck because there's two holes in it and it's probably an ornamental uh, piece. Um, and, and then other people started talking about what the spider could be and why there was a cross in the middle and and things like that. So I was starting to get there. But then the, the Googlers came in and the... Um, uh, uh, you know, the people who started to crowdsource these various search techniques uh, to find where I had found it online rather than to figure out, you know, well, what, what, uh, what, 
Native American tribe could this have been from, and why would it have been made out of shell if it was in the middle of Illinois? So I was hoping for this intellectual discussion, but it very rapidly um, moved into other avenues of discovery, which I guess is, is part of a valid uh, experiment here of what would happen. Um, so I, I guess I sort of proved my point, but um, maybe it also showed that people on Twitter prefer to take the easy way out as well. Um, <laughs> And and, it, and what what day of the week and time of day did this experiment occur? Well, I did this at uh, three p.m. Eastern time in uh, on the Thursday, so it was, it was a pretty ideal Twitter time. So uh, yeah, in other words, when audience. people should when people should be working <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to doing this. Yes, right. And, I, I right. lowered the GPAs of about a hundred people for an hour on, yeah. on Thursday. It was a good time to do it, also because on Twitter, you know, you've got worldwide followers, and I actually had. Um, uh, several people from uh, the UK, I think, who chimed in, um, and actually maybe even um, farther to the east in Europe. I can't, I can't remember specifically, but of course it was uh, 8, 8 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, so it was also a good evening activity for uh, Twitter friends of mine in Europe. Um, so there was a pretty good uh, number uh, of things. And I think something else that I'm uh, interested in as I look back on the experiment and are trying to figure out how to write it up is that um, what initially happened is that in the very first few moments, my uh, I said, I've got a mystery here. Can you solve it? And that tweet was retweeted, so passed along by other people who have other audiences. And so I think the actual reach of the experiment was very quickly within maybe five minutes got into the thousands, uh, maybe somewhere between three and 5,000 people would have had to have had a chance to see this. So um, right. You know, I think you need to. I think you need to pass this whole experiment along to that TV show, America's Most Wanted. <laughs> Have you seen this person? That's right. That's a great idea. Well, you know, uh, why not? Yeah, I don't think I've got enough followers on it. I guess we'll have to go to Ashton. Ashton Kusher could uh, do this. Could yeah, be. or Oprah. Get Oprah. Or Oprah. Right. Now that she's tweeting, so. Right. Although I read somewhere that she only does it in all capital letters. So. Oh goodness. Appara- I, I guess check that, that must be annoying. So, uh, or you could just start following her. Right, right. You, okay, you and well, well, several million of your closest friends. Right, exactly, exactly. So, well, but you know, there is. The, I, although I am not a Twitter user, I do in fact follow some of the news about Twitter, and um, there were sort of, as some people know, that I'm really interested in communism and post-communism in Europe and Asia, and, and there are a couple of um, sort of interesting Twitter bits of news about uh, over the last couple of weeks. One of them is um, that there was this kind of almost a revolution in Moldova a couple of weeks ago that they were originally calling the Twitter revolution because oh, right. yeah, because it, it, people some of the student organizers claimed that they had organized the the event through a combination of Facebook, Twitter and and text messaging. Um, and there was a piece in the Washington Post in the last couple of days by Ann Applebaum in which she calls it the Twitter revolution that wasn't um, which is because it turns out there were only you know dozens of Twitter accounts registered in Moldova, and so huh. that's not to, that's huh. not to say that that. That, the, huh. that the or the student the young the, the young people organizing the event still used digital technologies. I'm sure the text messaging was the main thing that they used, but um, so it didn't turn out to be Twitter. It turns out that the revolutionary aspects of it were actually like a scam by the Moldovan secret police, kind of a reprise of the good old days in the Soviet Union. But um, the other thing is that there was a story in, um, I think it was in TechCrunch, about the possibility of China blocking access to Twitter, that they've already blocked the um, Plurk, the, sim- the sort of the Twitter competitor, which is very mm. popular in, in Asia, um, and that their, you know, Twitter may be next, and that would really be a blow, I think, to Twitter as they, you know, as they move, march on toward world domination. Right, uh, yeah. Although, although I did also notice that Twitter has a ways to go yet. That they recently announced that they were approaching 20 million active users, which would give them about 10 percent of the universe that Facebook has. Huh. Well, so. yeah, right, right. Yeah, you know, I, I have to say, I, I you know, I, I have gotten a bit into Twitter lately, um, and uh, but I, I, I do worry a little bit about the perception of um, various colleagues. I showed up in a Chronicle of Higher Ed piece on Twitter as, as one of the sort of, active, of the active most stalked academics. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. I don't know. I, I, you know, I, I appreciate the publicity, but I also, I kind of wonder if uh, there's some other colleagues out there wondering what the heck I'm doing on Twitter, which is part of the reason I did this experiment to show that there, there might be some value there, but um, it'll be interesting as it gets more pre- penetration into, uh, 
into academia. I mean, what I'm noticing now for the first time is uh, as I go through, you know, our cafeteria um, and I used to see on students' notebooks that were open, nothing but Facebook pages. Um, you're, I'm now starting to see a smattering of Twitter, which really surprised me um, that it's, I think it's starting to get into that market. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see where it is in six months. I think we'll have to revisit this issue as much as you loathe, loathe the possibility of us discussing Twitter again on the podcast. Um, well, yeah, I can, I can live with it. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of more in-depth discussions and 140 characters, uh, Mills, are there any news stories you want to get to before we get to Stan, who's waiting in the wings for us to uh, discuss maybe things more substantive than Facebook well, and Twitter? Well, the, just two really brief things that I think are kind of follow-ons to things we've talked about over the last few podcasts. One of them, in, in terms of our prediction about 2009 being the year of the mobile device, um, uh, and, uh, T-Mobile has now announced that they've sold more than a million Android phones, um, and so there's one one piece of confirmation that we actually know what we're talking about. A second is that um, that the the app the iPhone App Store has now had its billionth download, which uh, is another yeah, piece of confirmation. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, and then the third is, and I don't know that there's any correlation here at all, but that it, it could just simply be the the one state, the wonderful state of the economy we're in at the moment. But um, for the first time in its history, Microsoft has reported a uh, decline in profits, um, sort of you know year to year or quarter to quarter comparison with last year, and um, and whether that's just generally the economy or, you know, the rise of, of all these netbooks or, you know, the, the increasing shift toward mobile devices rather than a computer. I mean, if you if you have an iPhone or an Android phone or something like that, what do you need a, a laptop for? Um, so I don't know that those things are correlated, but they certainly could be. Yeah, I think one of the um, analysts of that Microsoft uh, earnings report, um, and I do agree that that is pretty big news, I think did directly say, well, you know, there's a lot of netbooks out there with, uh, at best for Microsoft XP, um, and at worst, uh, you know, Linux on, on them. And, uh, you know, I, you know, we identified that as one of our top three trends for 2009, um, at the end of the year, uh, podcast in 2008. And, uh, I think it's only accelerating with the economy, what it is. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. It's an, it's an important story. And, uh, you know, there's a new version of windows, windows seven that's coming out. Um, you've got to wonder if it's going to kind of, uh, meet the same resistance that Vista did because, well, who needs that computing platform anymore? We've got, um, there's a, a computer maker that's going to come out with a netbook based on Android. So you could actually have an Android system on a netbook. And, uh, you know, again, for the student who's, you know, just needs a web browser to access Facebook or, um, you know, there's plenty of ways to access Twitter on a Linux notebook. Um, you know, what, what do they really need the full Windows operating system? Um, that is a big question, um, especially a resource-heavy operating system. Um, right. some, something that's right. light like uh, Linux or Android even as a kind of more cell phone operating environment uh, begins to be attractive. So, Well, it's, it's certainly one of these stories, and, and we've got to wonder what's coming up in the next couple of months with um, mobile devices from Palm and their new pre-platform which also th seems to have, um, I think, a very good development environment for those of us in academia or museums and libraries because it's based on web standards. So same kind of things that we use to develop websites. We'll, we'll be able to create applications for a, a pre-phone or a pre-netbook or whatever very easily. And then, of course, uh, uh, certainly there's going to be a new device and operating system from Apple this summer, uh, which will further kind of push the envelope on these mobile devices. Um, and I assume into areas like uh, there are, it's already moving, like book reading and annotation and all the kinds of things that we're you know interested in doing in our world. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the case. I think that's absolutely the case. I'm I'm very I'm very excited about um, the implications you know for the things I'm interested in about about the intersections of technology and teaching. I'm really excited about some of the things that I think are going to happen over the next two years with mobile devices. Right, and I think for, in your case in particular, we're going to have really a variety of relatively inexpensive devices, you know, non-laptop devices that you could use in the classroom or you could, you know, hand out to students and not worry about them dropping them or losing them for a semester. Um, and, and that presents some very exciting possibilities for distribution of materials, for doing uh, digital kind of work in the classroom. Um, yep. surely, surely that's something we're going to revisit. 
Well, maybe we'll, we should move on and uh, get Stan out, who's uh, waiting behind the uh, curtain, uh, have him join us and talk about these very same issues and how he sees it from uh, his perspective. <laughs> Well, we're incredibly lucky today on the podcast to have a visitor from Princeton, a friend of the Center for History and New Media, a longtime friend of the Center, um, and someone who's incredibly knowledgeable about all matters relating to digital humanities and the way that digital media and technology relate to what's going on in the academy and in libraries and museums. Uh, we'd like to welcome Stan Katz to the podcast. Hi, Stan. Hi. Thanks, welcome. Dan. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Um, and our, our audience probably knows about you, but just to mention that you are um, at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, and uh, you're president emeritus of the American Council of Learned Societies, and um, someone who does research on civil society and, and constitutions. Is that right? Um, That's right. As they relate right. to democracies. Um, and among many other awards and, and things that you've done, um, it's really an incredible biography I'm looking at here uh, as I Googled you. Um, but you are a former president of the American, uh, the Organization of American Historians and the American Society for Legal History um, and uh, have served on many boards, including the, the Newberry Library and um, other institutions. So it's wonderful to have you on the podcast. And I guess, you know, one of the reasons that, that we wanted to have you on is um, you've been really thinking about um, what we talk about on this podcast for a couple of decades now. Um, maybe a good place to start is, could you just sort of mention how you began to see uh, digital media and technology as a force that was really going to be important for academia and, and sort of how you began to get interested in that and some of your first attempts to see what this um, this new technology could do. Sure, Dan. I mean, I can date it pretty much exactly. Uh, I became the president of uh, ACLS uh, in July of 1986. And my first uh, shock in that job was to come into the office on July 1st and discover that there was only one computer in the office that was in the accounting office, and it was used in a very primitive kind of way. So the next thing that happened was that I purchased a computer for everybody in the office. That doesn't sound like much. Um, there was only one email user at ACLS at that point. So we set about getting everybody on email and it took us the better part of the year, I think, to convince everyone that email was a technology here to stay. But I really got started on this. Um, that year, we had been the publishers for a very long time uh, of the Dictionary of American Biography. It was 33 volumes. It needed desperately to be redone and to be uh, done in a more accessible form. So I set out to uh, get a contract with a publisher to redo this uh, book, but I had one condition, and that is that um, ACLS wouldn't agree to do a new book, uh, and it was a mammoth project, um, unless we could find a publisher who was willing simultaneously to do an electronic book and an analog book. And it turned out that almost no publisher was willing to do it. Macmillan was our publisher at the time. And the president of Macmillan, a man, a very distinguished publisher named Jerry Kaplan, assured me that there was no future to electronic publication. <laughs> they weren't about to do it. Right. And uh, so we severed our connection, which went back to 1927 uh, with Macmillan. And I signed with uh, Oxford. OUP had just recently brought out the OED, the English Dictionary, online. Uh, so I figured they would know how to do it. It took us 11 years to get the job done, but you know it, it did result in an analog book, which initially was 24 volumes and, I don't know, 18,000 biographies or something like that. But we did have a simultaneous uh, uh, online publication, uh, and it continues. And in fact, by the way, I'm really proud of this. We made an arrangement by which both Oxford and ACLS contribute part of their uh, royalties to a revolving fund. And so, in effect, what we have done, I think, is to create the first endowed uh, electronic book because now the editorial office is sustained by this steady flow of income that comes from both, actually, the analog and the online version. So that's where I got going on it. Um, I was convinced, seemed obvious, that with reference works, it um, didn't make much sense to have analog books anymore, or at least you certainly needed uh, a parallel um, book. 
but the other area in which I was uh, very much engaged was journals, because uh, there were at that time 50-odd uh, constituent societies in ACLS, and um, as part of the admissions process, every one of them had to publish a journal. So that meant we had 56 journals. <clears throat> there was not a single electronic journal uh, among them. And I think at the first meeting I had with the executive directors of the societies, I said, you know, within 10 years, uh, you're all going to have electronic journals. Um, you won't anymore, I think I said, have print journals. That was wrong. Um, but they were just horrified, and they thought this was a crazy idea. Um, I tried to argue to them that um, there were a whole lot of reasons why this was going to be true, but the most important one was that they were going to be able to do things, um, do scholarly things in the electronic environment that they simply couldn't do in the analog environment. There were maybe two people in the room who understood what I was talking about. And as I say, I got a very hostile response um, to that. Um, and I have, certainly haven't counted now, but most of the, they're over 60 now, and of course most of them are publishing uh, electronically. Now that's, uh, that's over 20 years ago, so it took a long time uh, to do. But I felt very strongly about that, and actually, uh, you didn't mention in the intro, but I was uh, for three years the vice president of the American Historical Association, um, and the way the AHA works, there are three vice presidents. My area was research, and part of the job of the vice president for research was to be the overseer of the American Historical Review. And uh, um, Michael Grossberg was at the time the editor, and I still remember the conversation I had with him. And I said, Mike, I have only one objective for the next three years, and that is to ensure that the AHR uh, begin to uh, publish an electronic uh, version. He was adamantly against that. He couldn't see the point of it. But I asked him to do a report about what the challenge would be in converting to an electronic form or having a parallel electronic publication. In the course of that, he wrote a wonderful report and he became convinced that it was a good idea because he looked at what other people were doing at that point. And indeed, um, we published electronically in that third year so that uh, there is now uh, an electronic AHR. So it was, it was in and that... And what year was that, Stan? Well, let's see... Uh, you know, I'd have to look it up, but that was in the around the turn of the century. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it was. I think it was maybe two thousand one. And I and I would just say that getting the American Historical Association to do anything in three years is an incredible achievement. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, well, I thought so. And, and by the way, but that was only the I should say you know it was only the first part of it because the other struggle uh, that you would understand, but I find not everybody does, <clears throat> is to get people to understand that an electronic book or an electronic journal is not simply digitized text. Right. Yeah, sure. And so then, then the struggle was to get people to see that we needed to publish the kinds of articles that uh, used the technology and actually became scholarly artifacts that were quite distinctive from paper artifacts. And in fact, my argument was that we wouldn't know we had succeeded until we realized that the analog version didn't anymore represent the scholarship that we were publishing. It's interesting as you discuss this history. Um, you know, you talk about this resistance all along that that really you had to push. Right. And I know um, Roy Rosenzweig, um, our good friend, who also was right. the the vice president of research uh, at the HA. Um, why do you think? And you know, Mills and I have had many conversations about this on the podcast and off that there continues to be actually even in two thousand nine a considerable resistance to online publishing. Um, mm -hmm. what, what is your diagnosis of that? Is, is it that, uh, let's say historians, just to, to stick with uh, what we know, um, are sort of traditionalists about uh, the, the form of their scholarship, or is it um, a lack of knowledge about the technology? Why, why is there this fairly significant resistance um, to moving online, uh, even mm -hmm. even now? Well, I, I mean, I think at least in part, it's uh, humanities-wide. I would say history is no no different than other fields in the humanities sure. by and large. And I, I do think it is that historians and humanists are very traditional in their research methods. Uh, the fields that have been using technology to uh, actually do scholarship obviously had less difficulty in accepting that online publication might be a good idea because they already had artifacts that were in digital form. 
most of us didn't have artifacts that were in digital form, and in fact, most humanists don't realize that what they produce on their computer um, is a digital artifact. But in, but it's not importantly a digital artifact. So I think that's a big, a big part of it. Those people who you know, and so it's a small number of us, for instance, who do computation. But for those humanists who do computation, I think it's less of a leap. But most of us don't do it, and until recently, most of us <clears throat> weren't using images or sound or other things for which the electronic environment would be uh, inevitable um, and a, a, bi a big advantage. So I think that's really a very big part of it. I think that humanists haven't seen the advantage to it. And if you don't see, and in fact I would say myself, if there isn't an enhancement of scholarship, I, it's not a big deal. Why should we care? I mean, there are reasons why we should care. But the case is easier to make if we can do different or better scholarship. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, it seems that there's been some resistance in um, to, I guess, what's now being called digital scholarship in that, um, at least as I've seen it, that um, it feels a little bit too much like a redux of uh, some quantitative history from exactly. the no, 1970s. That's exactly and um, are, are there <clears throat> some things that you've seen, some examples or some things you've done yourself that, that point a way to a kind of digital scholarship that you feel would be acceptable to, um, to, to humanities scholars um, because it, for instance, gives new insights that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise? Well, of course, I mean, uh, <clears throat> that has been the disappointing, to me, the big disappointment, because, you know, those of us who have argued for, for instance, online publication <clears throat> have pretty much won. Uh, that is to say that the online publications exist now. <clears throat> Where we haven't yet won is to convince colleagues that uh, new kinds of scholarship are uh, not only possible, but desirable and they ought to be rewarded in the same ways that traditional scholarship ought to be. So, as you know better than I, we're still having trouble convincing um, peer review committees, you know, promotion and tenure committees, that um, certain kinds of digital scholarship uh, ought to be rewarded in exactly the same sort of way. And I think this really is a, a methodological conservatism in the humanities, which is really overwhelming and just very hard to uh, to push uh, to push against. I think what it depends on, frankly, is the emergence of exciting new scholarship that those who don't do the scholarship will recognize um, is is interesting, is better than what could be done another way. So if you go back, for instance, to uh, the Valley of the Shadow to Ed Ayer's project, you know, a lot of people were touting that it was a very interesting thing to do. Um, but it, in retrospect, it looks kind of like a one-shot war. And so, you know, what else is there? We haven't had enough of, you know, we haven't had enough valleys of the shadow uh, to convince people, I think, that there is something really um, so valuable about this that they have to learn how to do it and they have to reward it. So uh, that's my one disappointment. Yeah. Um, are there things that have changed that you that sort of give rise to some optimism in, uh, from your point of view about the future? Um, are there? I mean, clearly the journals have come online now. We're we're all used to accessing them in that right. way. Um, are there other things if, if people aren't doing Valley of the Shadows that um, or something like Google Books? Um, is that changing the way people are starting to view these things? I mean, do you find yourself in conversations now with colleagues that? Um, you feel like the tone is slightly different than, let's say, in 1996 or 1986? Well, you know, I, in a way I'm discouraged um, because I think we won the threshold battle. And the threshold battle is simply for the, for the, the uh, establishment of the medium. And, and it's there, it can be improved and so forth. The battle we've won, I would say, as scholars is the battle for access to information. Everybody accepts now that this is a better way to access information. We can do things, even conservative scholars understand that uh, searching online, for instance, uh, is infinitely superior to, uh, to traditional methods of uh, searching. So we have won that battle, and everybody you know, looks at catalogs all over the world for uh, OPEX uh, and so forth. So that's great. But we, we haven't... Um, convinced people, because we're not doing it, um, that methodologically 
there are huge gains to be uh, to be made here, and to me that's really been a tremendous uh, disappointment. And I think what it means is that we have to have better strategies than we have now for both for training younger people and something I have pushed for for a long time is having the human infrastructure on university and college campuses to help faculty and graduate students do research and develop research projects because I think that we can't count on people by and large to do that themselves. Sure. It's a lot. It's quite a bit to learn. Um, and, you know, as you know, the environments like that are just very rare. Um, you know, Mills and I feel very lucky to have <laughs> colleagues who are programmers and web designers and database exactly. administrators, et cetera, that we can launch projects from uh, very easily. Um, you know, you've done so much work with, um, as a leader, really, of institutions and professional organizations. Is there a role there that you see in the future, let's say in the next decade for the AHA or ACLS, um, that they can push on these issues, um, let's say, sure. relating to um, training or uh, peer review, um, right. tenure and promotion. Um, are those the, the proper location for the, these sorts of things? Well, absolutely. But, I mean, that's another disappointment. Um, I, you know, to talk about my own former organization, uh, as you know, uh, ACLS was one of the sponsors of the Cyber Humanities Cyber Infrastructure Project, which I thought was exactly the right um, approach. And uh, the report is a useful report. I don't think it's a great report, but maybe you can't write a great report. But uh, not much has happened since then. I mean, ACLS, in my view, should have hired a program officer. And ACLS ought to be the place in the humanities where it's sort of digital central uh, because we need leadership on this, but for a variety of reasons that hasn't happened. Um, it's difficult, uh, you know, when I was at the research division at the AHA, we were very active. When Roy was, uh, Roy succeeded me. So that was great. So we had six years running of um, people who really cared about this, but it hasn't been the case since then. Um, the OAH um, hasn't done it, and most of the other historical organizations haven't done it. Uh, the presidents of those organizations, who, after all, only serve a one-year tenure, it's tough for them. But it would help if one of them really championed this. The only one we've had who did was Bob Darton, and that was very helpful, although Bob and I usually didn't agree about what it all meant, but that's less important than that he was an enthusiast for it and spoke out very eloquently. Well, for instance, I mean, he wrote in the New York Review of Books about the digital, about digital history and digital humanities. I think it was enormously helpful to have that. But if you look around now, of course, we don't have Roy. Uh, we've got your center. But we have, there are very few IF at Virginia <clears throat> isn't playing the same role it did. My view now is that George Mason is uh, is where it's happening, and that's great, but it's not enough. Uh, there are other good centers. Uh, I've been a fan of the Maryland Center, and uh, there are others around the country. But, you know, there are not many. And so, yeah, we have to find ways of developing and sustaining leadership. And, Stan, that, that kind of leads to my question, which is, uh, you know, you've been so involved in this for the last 20 years now, it's hard to imagine that digital things have been around that long, uh, but you've been so involved in this. Now, can you look forward a little bit and, and say, you know, what do you think some of the big things are that are coming down the pike? Well, you see, I think in a way the biggest thing coming down the pike is um, something that's negative, and that is uh, I think what we're going to see is the fairly rapid decline of academic presses in the traditional form. Um, I think that the, the academic monograph in the humanities um, is, is dying. Uh, and I mean by that the analog uh, monograph, uh, mostly um, books in the humanities, monographs in the humanities sell 200 hard copy, uh, and that's not enough uh, to sustain it. So we're already at a point, but I think in a few years we'll be definitively there, where there is no sort of immediate analog publication of these um, these books. Uh, I think it's going to be almost entirely. Um, uh, on demand, but that'll really mean that the <clears throat> the digital version is the basic version of the uh, of the book, and uh, people are just then going to have to accept that these are ebooks. When we when we have that, 
I think that's going to be an incentive to make them into real e-books. And I think that will be enormously important. So when we, you know, when, when, when that happens, and it is happening right now, the other thing I think that's going to happen is I think we're going to see more and more university presses uh, merge with libraries. And uh, my hope, frankly, is that uh, libraries are going to be more and more digital. What we're going to see over the next few years is some really major announcements of mergers. Uh, across university libraries, which are going to engage in joint collecting of uh, books and other kinds of information. Um, they are going to deaccession into central storage, shared storage, um, the large portions of their analog holdings, and they are going to take over the publication uh, functions uh, that academic presses have by and large performed. I think what we'll wind up with is a rather small number of large university presses like um, Princeton would be an example, Harvard, and so forth, but not many. Uh, and uh, in that environment, and then I think we're, we're going to have the technology in the libraries, uh, and uh, the technology, in fact, is going to be better married to the publication than it is in academic presses at the moment. So oddly enough, uh, this is the sort of Rahm Emanuel approach. Uh, I think in this crisis, there's an opportunity. Mm. So I, I'm oddly um, optimistic that we're going to be forced to go digital. And But then the real burden, and this is my long-term concern, is sort of uh, working with particularly younger scholars to develop digital forms of scholarship. I mean, there's nothing wrong with traditional scholarship. I know both of you would agree with me about that. But on the other hand, we're just not getting the most out of the, the new environment if it's not provoking some genuinely new approaches. Yeah, and this is, this is one of the things that's bothered me for a while. I mean, on the one hand, you know, it's great for George Mason that we have this this PhD program with the digital component to it right. and that we still don't have any competition. I mean, Nebraska is going to start their program, right. I guess, this fall. But um, it, it it really bothers me that, you know, given the things that you've been talking about, that, that departments around the country, you know, that some of the major departments that ought to be doing this aren't. And right. so, on the, you know, on the one hand, I, you know, I'm happy for us to have a semi-captive market for our PhD program, but it's really bad. It's really bad for the profession. Uh, it's terrible. History. So, it's terrible. Uh, and, and so what do you think it's going to take to convince – I mean, is it really going to be the death of the monograph that's going to convince departments, wow, we have to actually do something here? Well, no, I don't think it will. Um, you know, I'm, I'm d deeply pessimistic about uh, departments generally. Um, and you know, I have a, a stock lecture I sometimes give called the department as the enemy of knowledge. But that's a slightly different um, <laughs> uh, topic, I guess. No, I mean, I, the hope is in younger scholars. Uh, it's only going to happen as you know. It's the the young the young Mills Kelly, the young Roy Rosenzweig, the the young Dan Cohn. We we need to train places, uh, people at your place and other places, and as we need exemplars. I don't think it takes a lot, but I think over let's say the next decade, if we you know if we could produce a dozen younger scholars who are doing cutting edge digital history, it'll happen. So uh, I would put all of my money on working with young scholars. I, yeah, I really think that's where it's at. You know, I, I, I think you're, you're right. I, I know somebody who applied, um, somebody sort of a mid-career person who applied for a position recently as the chair of a department that had a, a large um, historic preservation program as part of their, their MA offerings. And, um, and in the job talk, talked a good bit about the importance of, you know, the digital future in historic mm -hmm. preservation and could tell that it was, that that was absolutely the wrong talk and that, that right. there was no way, that there was no way they were getting the job at this point. That yeah, the, well, the, I mean, the audience in the room was just like, oh, digital person, forget it, get out of here fast. Yeah, well, it's, it just, it's going to be projects. I, I work with a project that, now that's uh, sort of setting up a really uh, a, a not-for-profit company to develop um, databases for teaching. That's the other thing. Um, if we could talk about that just for a moment. We haven't talked about that. I think where we've made the least progress is in um, applying digital technology to teaching in history and the humanities. And I think it's hugely important. We're just not taking advantage of that. There, there are a lot of reasons here the investment, the infrastructure problem is even more apparent, and there are plenty of people who might like to do it, but are in institutions where they really couldn't do it. They don't have the wherewithal to do it. So that needs an investment. This isn't a very good 
time in history to make investments. But I think it's crucial, and I don't think we're going to find the the real gain in scholarship uh, until we have gains in teaching. In some ways, I think teaching is e- easier. I think the techniques are um, more more readily disseminated, uh, and so I'm actually fairly optimistic about that. I think when we're teaching students digitally, when we're showing, when we're encouraging them to use digital uh, techniques in order to do their own work. Um, that's how the whole thing is going to be generated. And we've, we've tended to ignore the relationship between research and teaching. So I think we need to be working on both tracks. And at the moment, although apart from the investment part of it, I'm more optimistic about the teaching because I think there's tremendous concern to improve methods of teaching. We might find that easier uh, to do. Right. Certainly something, Mills, that you've tackled on the podcast. Right. Um, well, yeah, yeah, and 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 it is honestly, it is the path of least resistance. I mean, it is so much easier to to gain acceptance for the use of digital work in teaching because, well, that's just teaching, and so that's okay. It seems like it seems like the stakes are lower in some ways, when in fact, I would argue the stakes are actually a lot higher. Well, I, I you know I agree entirely with that, but I think that people do perceive the stakes as being lower, and I think it's a, I think it's an advantage, and. I just think that's an area where we could make some pretty rapid gains. And my guess is that until we do, we're not going to make gains on the research and publication front. Well, Stan, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Um, it's it's terrific to hear all these insights and to get both a historical and president's, pres, presentist and futurist <laughs> sense uh, from you of where you see all these things going. Um, Stan Katz, thanks so much for joining us on Digital Campus, and yeah, we hope and, we can uh, have you back again as well as we discuss other things. Yeah, it was and, a lot uh, of fun. And I just want to add, as one of the few owners of a, uh, a Stan Katz baseball card, <laughs> um, I, you know, I, it was a real pleasure to have you on today, Stan. Great. Thanks, Mills, and thanks, Dan. Thank you. Please visit us online at digitalcampus.tv, where you can join in the discussion and let us know about stories and issues you would like us to cover on future episodes. Mike O'Malley wrote our theme music. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country.